Uh, thanks, Bridgie. I hope you guys know what great pastors you've got here. Come on, you know how great your leaders are. They're just men and women full of uh, faith and joy and just believing for great things, not just for this church, but uh, for our city and for our nation and for our movement. So please keep uh, praying for your leaders. Keep praying for your pastors. They are doing an awesome job. They're, they're a blessing to me. They're, they're a blessing uh, to our movement. It's always great to be here at Bridgie, even though I probably only come here once a year. It feels like family. I feel like uh, I get well welcomed as, as family. I love the heart of this family. You know, the heart of this family, I've been captured by it for 19 years since I've been in Brisbane to, uh, to, to welcome the crowds, to, uh, to teach about the kingdom and to heal those who need healing. And I hope today that God might use me by his spirit, through his word, to encourage you on that mission to see more and more people uh, from the community welcomed in and find the healing that only Jesus uh, can bring. We've just had some special moments uh, as a family, ourselves. We've just had a holiday in uh, New Zealand. My parents decided to spend my inheritance while they're still alive and uh, took all of us, 20 of us, uh, my, me and my family, my sisters and uh, their family, all of us went to, uh, to Wanaka in New Zealand for a week. There's us at uh, Lake Wanaka, a really uh, special time together. Two of my nieces uh, rang me before we went, who live in Sydney, and said, would you baptise us uh, when we're in New Zealand uh, together? And they wanted to get baptised in Lake Wanaka. We, we got there, it's one and a half degrees. I kind of, I put my toes in and said, look, you know, if I was allowed to baptise you by sprinkling, maybe. But, you know, I'm kind of a Baptist, you know, it's, it's full immersion or nothing. And I do not want to see Jesus face to face just yet. And uh, so we found a hot tub on the side of a hill in uh, New, New Zealand. And I had uh, the, the joy of baptising uh, two of my nieces. And we got to stand with the whole family family and reminded them of what uh, Paul said to Timothy when he said, you know, I want to remind you, Timothy, that faith first resided in your grandmother Lois. And I got to say to my two nieces, have a look around, faith first resided in your grandmother, not Lois, but Louise and her, pretty close, and, uh, and her husband Ken has been passed down uh, to your mums, neither of them called Eunice, but uh, been passed down and I'm now convinced lives also in you. And we got to have a family moment just as they got baptised, all of heaven uh, celebrated and I want to remind you today, that's the inheritance that matters. I might not get a brass razu when my parents uh, go to be in, in glory, but we have an inheritance in Jesus that will never perish, spoil or fade. You know, how good, how good is that? That was day one of our holiday. Day two of our holiday, my son proposed to his girlfriend on the, on the uh, foreshore of Lake Wanaka at sunrise. He's a romantic like his dad. And why do people laugh at that? What, what is it about me that you think I'm not uh, romantic? Anyway, he was very, he, he was very uh, romantic and uh, we are absolutely stoked. Firstly, because uh, she loves Jesus and uh, secondly, because I like her. And, uh, you know, I, I've been praying. I've been praying that my kids would choose partners that love Jesus and I like, because I got to hang out with them, you know, for, for decades uh, to come. So, you know, pray specifically, you know, when, when you are praying for your kids. And then day three of a holiday, I looked around and said, come on, we've had two baptisms and engagement. Is anyone pregnant? I mean, what, what, what are we, what's happening today? Uh, it was a great, great, uh, great family celebration. That, that's the heart of the Father in heaven. You know, our, our family went from 20 to 21, or will, next uh, 6th of April next year when they get married. And uh, that's the heart of the Father. He just loved to see more and more people come into his family, 
to join his family, to see you know, faith passed down from generation uh, to generation. I hope God might put some faith in your heart for that in your family and the people around you uh, today. I want to read from Acts chapter 16. It says, Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging. Everyone say begging. begging. He was begging him. Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, today I've got four U's for you. All right, four points, all starting with the letter U. Now, any Baptist preacher can preach three P's. In fact, you don't even have to be saved to preach three C's. But four U's is a big effort. I bet you none of you have ever heard a sermon with four U's today. The first one is this, you know, the unction, everyone say unction. It's a word that doesn't get used enough anymore. The, the unction of the Spirit always leads us to people who need Jesus. Who here remembers that old song, give me unction in my gumption, help me function? Show of hands. Okay, everyone Peter's age and older remembers it. You know, my grandmother used to sing it to me, give me unction in my gumption, help me function. And I believe the unction, the anointing, the, the whisper of the Holy Spirit within us will always lead us to people who need Jesus. Here in Acts chapter 16, we see Paul and his companions, they're, they're, they're fulfilling the Great Commission. They're, they're doing the right thing. They're taking the Gospel uh, to, to people and to places, to cities and communities who desperately needed to, to hear the Gospel. And they wanted to go into a part of uh, what was then called the province of Asia, part of modern day Turkey today. And they wanted to, to walk into those places and to take the Gospel uh, to them. And it says that even though they're doing the right thing, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go there. And then when they tried to go into the, the next place in a similar region, similar part of the world, you know, it says that the Holy Spirit stopped them. I really love the footnotes for this moment. How? How did the Holy Spirit stop them? You know, how did the Spirit of Jesus not allow them to go into this place? Was there some kind of you know, magnetic force field that came down? Was there kind of some sign saying, you know, no evangelists any further? Was there some big booming voice from heaven, do not enter? We don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. But I'm convinced, I'm convinced that if it was something demonstrative like that, Luke the historian would have recorded it. If there was some big moment, earthquake and thunder and lightning, because he does record those moments in his, in his history book, Luke would have recorded it for us. My hunch is that as they were praying and as they were going to take the gospel to people, the Holy Spirit whispered to them, that they knew the unction of the Spirit saying, this is not the right way to go. This is not where I want you to go in this time. And as they listened to the unction of the Spirit, it led them to a place and to people who had never heard the good news of Jesus before. The unction of the Spirit always leads us to people who need Jesus. One of the most powerful moments in my life was in uh, 2008 and I was standing outside a brothel in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I was with my friend, my friend Ruth who uh, we were there investigating what it would mean to establish a vocational training centre for girls rescued from sex trafficking in Cambodia. And I must admit I got to the end of the week and I thought, this is too hard. I, I don't know what to do. 
I, I just don't think we can do this. That was my human logic speaking. But as I sat in that tuk-tuk, about to go and get on a comfortable plane to come back to comfortable Brisbane, and I'm saying goodbye to this girl named Nita, who was sold at 12 years of age. And she was rescued when, when she was 15, had no education, no way of earning an income, and was actually resold. And she had a little baby now that was about 18 months old and the brothel owner said to her, when this baby comes of age, she too will be sold. This will be her future. She was desperate, but she had nowhere to go and uh, no way out of the situation that she was stuck in. And as I was saying goodbye, I just heard the unction of the Spirit to say, do it for Nita, she's worth the effort. And I'm glad that we listen to the unction of the Spirit because years later we've now baptised 224 girls who have not only received an education and have a way of earning an income, but they've put their faith in Jesus from a Buddhist background and he has transformed them, restored them, healed them from the inside out. And I'm telling you, it has restored and renewed my faith in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the power of the gospel is the only power for salvation for anyone who believes. It does not matter how broken, it does not matter how, how dark your life is, it does not matter how far away you feel from God, that the good news of Jesus Christ can heal and restore and redeem any life. The unction of the Spirit. It's been one of the great joys of my life. Always lead us to people who need Jesus. Simple prayer you can pray this week. Who do you want me to notice? Jesus, who who do you want me to notice? I I met uh, a couple at the back of our church one one Sunday morning that I'd never met before. I think it was their first time at church from memory. And I was talking to the husband and wife and said goodbye. And I just happened to see the husband the next day on the Monday night in the shops. Now, your pastors love people and they got plenty of time uh, for people. But on a Monday, when I get to the shops, I'm sometimes tempted to avoid people from church. You know, I can't, I'm an introvert. I just need a little bit of space. Uh, sometimes, often, I, I kind of hide and duck into a shop. But I just had a moment on this Monday night when I saw this guy that I'd met for the first time the day before. I had this Acts chapter 8 Philip moment where I just felt like the Spirit said to me, go and stand near that guy. Go and get in his face. Be near him. And so I did. I went up and started talking to him. And he said to me, once he was outside the four church walls and we were in the shopping centre, he says, you know I don't believe any of that stuff. I'm only in coming to church because of my wife. Who, who does believe and I want to support her and be respectful and help her with the kids, but I don't believe any of this stuff. I said, that's fine. We started a conversation, you know, got to know each other a little bit. Over the next 18 months, every time he came to church, I made a beeline for him. I just got near him. And then I'd see him in the shops every couple of weeks. He lived near me. I'd make a beeline for him. After about 18 months, we had enough of a friendship. I said, mate, can we sit down and just talk you know, about, about faith, about Jesus, where you're at? And so we met in that shopping centre, in the food court, and we sat down. He looked me in the eyes and he said, I feel like I've got a target on my back. You find me everywhere I go. And I go, oh, mate, you do have a target on your back, but I didn't put it there. The God of heaven saw you and he knew that you needed a saviour, mate. He's on your case. And this is what he said to me, just, you know, go and stand near Rob. And so I have, and I got to explain the good news of Jesus to him there in that shopping centre. And he put his faith in Christ there. And then a couple of months later, I got to baptise him and two of his uh, kids and these days, the funny thing is, this is about four or five years ago, I rarely see him at the shops. <laughs> but just occasionally, once or twice a year, I bump into him. 
And just last Christmas, we, we walked past each other and he just pointed to that table. He said, remember what God did there. My whole family is now following Jesus. I tell you, sometimes the unction of the Spirit is simple. Just go and hang out with that person. Go and stand near that person. Go and love that person the way that Jesus loves that person and just see what God does. The unction of the Spirit always leads us to people who need Jesus. Who does Jesus want you to notice this week? Secondly, there's an urgency to share the gospel when we're filled with the power of the Spirit. You know, they, they wanted to walk into, you know, the province of Asia because they could walk. They knew how to walk. They didn't know how to swim. To get to Macedonia, they had to get on a boat and there's no life jackets, there's no floaties, they'd had no swimming lessons, it's not a cruise ship, it's a rickety old, old boat. They didn't like the water. We read those stories, you know, in, in the Gospels, they were scared of the wind and, and the waves. They didn't want to get on a boat. But when Paul has this vision of a, in Troas of a man from Macedonia begging him to, to go and to share the gospel with him, even though they didn't want to get into the water, they immediately, they immediately, they got ready at once to go to Macedonia because they knew that the people there needed the gospel always. You see, when we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, there's an urgency to share the good news of Jesus. Or like your value cell says, we are compelled to reach out. You don't get urgent, you don't get compelled by a motivational talk. It doesn't have the power to do it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit within us that compels us to reach, reach out, that, that creates an urgency within us to take the gospel to people who desperately need it. I, I remember when I was 19 and I fully surrendered my life to Christ and I had a moment where I just knew the power of the Holy Spirit you know, within me for the first time. And there was this urgency there was this urgency in me, you know, to tell people about the, the good news of Jesus. No one had to tell me to do it and no one could stop me from doing it. I remember for the first time in my life, I was actually lining up, you know, uh, at an event to, to go to the toilet and I needed to go urgently. But there was a greater urgency within me before I, I, I got there. I turned to the guy next to me and I said, do you know how much Jesus loves you? It's a pretty awkward conversation when you're going to do what you're going to do. I just, I just couldn't hold it in. There was such an urgency in me. I was really disappointed when Gareth, I've never forgotten his name, said, mate, I'm already a Christian. I go, oh, God, what are you, what are you doing? I got, the, I got the courage to tell someone about Jesus and he's, he, he's already there. That there's an urgency. And we see a change here. See, in Acts 1.8, it, it says, Luke, the historian, records Jesus saying, you know, don't do anything, don't go anywhere until the power of my Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Next 15 chapters, Luke is recording, he's celebrating people filled with the Spirit, sharing the good news of Jesus. He's, he's sharing the story, celebrating the stories. But there's a change here in verse 10. If you just look here in verse 10, it's not obvious until you, know, you kind of read the, the whole book, but in verse 10, it moves to we and us. We got ready at once because we believed that, that God was calling us to share the gospel with them. It's the first time Luke records in the first person. At this moment, Luke moves from Luke the historian to Luke the evangelist. Luke the doctor to Luke the missionary. And I believe it's a word, as I've reflected on this passage, I believe it's a word for our QB movement. I believe right across our state for decades now, 
We, there's a heart in our church to celebrate, to support, to tell the stories of those who have called to mission around the world. And we do it pretty well, by and large. And we've got to keep doing it. We've got to keep sending people to the nations. But I feel like God has just highlighted this verse to me. He's calling his church in this season to all join the mission team. What if we're all part of the mission team here in this nation, in our community? We're still celebrating and supporting those who are going to the other nations. But what if as a whole church here at Bridgie and what if as a whole movement across our state, we were all part of the mission team, all filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, with an urgency to take the gospel to the people that we live, work and laugh with, the people in, in our community. I look back to when I was 19, I first knew that just the filling, the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of my marker when I don't feel that same urgency to share the gospel as I did when I was 19, when I feel it kind of draining away. I know I need to come back to God and say, fill me up, fill me up. I need, I need less of me and more of you. And I wonder if that's just a moment for some of us here today. Maybe some of us have actually been disappointed. We've, we've kind of had a go in the past at sharing the gospel with someone and just didn't quite work out all that well. Or, or maybe you've been praying for someone for decades and you just haven't seen any change yet. There'll be people, there's someone in this room who's, who's actually disappointed with the church, haven't quite supported or celebrated the gift that God has put in your life. I actually think there's someone here today, you're actually disappointed with God. You kind of feel like you did respond to the unction of the Spirit and you felt like God didn't turn up the way you expected Him to. I believe God's calling some of us today to let it go, to actually surrender ourselves afresh to Jesus and say, come Holy Spirit. Come and fill me with power. Come and fill me with an urgency. Let go of disillusionment and disappointment. God, may you fill me with power and urgency to take the gospel to people around us. Do you notice in this story, the man from Macedonia is begging Paul to come. What you need to understand about Macedonia is, it was kind of the centre of wealth and influence and education and culture. It was, it was kind of the place, you know, in, in, the, in the region where people had it all together. You know, they were from Macedonia. They, they, they were the people who had it all. They had the shiny facade. Life is going good for us. Yet, they are, someone is begging, begging Paul to come and to share the good news. I don't know if you've worked this out yet, but I've been pastoring for long enough to know that people out there in our community that got the shiny facade, got the wealth, got the education, look like they've got it all together. On the inside, in, the, in, the dark, in their dark moments, there's a cry in their heart, there's gotta be more than this. There's gotta be more than this. They are begging for there to be more than this in life. I believe we've got an opportunity right now as the church in this nation. God is stirring. God is moving. I've seen more people baptised this year than in, 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 in a six-month period than in the last 30 years. I, I've seen people come to faith in their 70s, 80s and 90s than I've seen more, more people in those age groups than I ever have before in the last 30 years. I, I'm seeing, you know, millennials, a younger generation, just coming to church going, I'm happy to dabble in this and just find out what is going on. And as they come and dabble, God moves in their heart and brings them to a place of surrender. God is moving in this season. We get to be part of it, church. We get to be part of seeing generational lines change, of seeing blessings throw, uh, flow, curses broken off. Just listen to the unction of the Spirit. Come before Father in heaven, just surrender us lives afresh to Him, so fill me with power and urgency to take the gospel. Third you, 
Unexpected people in unexpected places planting unprecedented churches. Come on, that's three U's in the third point alone. Come on, that deserves a little bit of... Acts. Acts uh, 16, 15, it says, on the Sabbath day, they've got to, uh, to Philippi in Macedonia by now. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river. This is what they expected. We expected to find a place of prayer. But we sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. First convert in Philippi is a lady named Lydia. They go to the river expecting to find a place of prayer but unexpectedly they find that God's already answered some of their prayers. There's a lady there named Lydia who's a worshipper of God. She hasn't yet heard the gospel. She hasn't actually become a proselyte. She hasn't become you know, uh, a Jew, but she's, she wants to know the God of Israel. She wants to worship the God of Israel. And her heart is ready to hear the gospel. As Paul shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, she opens her heart, puts her faith in him and her and her whole household get baptised. This is unexpected favour, but I want to encourage you today to expect it. Sometimes if you turn on the news or your Facebook feed, you would think the whole of our nation are angry atheists. It's not true. There's Lydia's everywhere. They come to your Christmas carol services. I tell you, we were laughing so hard at last year's carol service here at Bridgie with a camel running down the road. Right? Yes. That was so cool. We, uh, I wanted to move to the north side just to be part of the, 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 the church with camels, I tell you. But there are thousands of Lydia's that come into these walls to hear the, hear the good news of Jesus. There, there are people who, who want to help out with your, your care programs around the city because they're sympathetic to the things of Jesus. They're just waiting for someone to share the good news of Jesus with them. Lydia hears it. She's already ready. She puts her faith in Jesus. whole family gets redeemed. I had the joy of baptising a Lydia named Kate a few years ago. She's now our operations director. She works full time on our staff. But a number of years ago, she came to church having never been to church before. Her twin daughters were very sick in, in hospital. She asked me to dedicate them, even though she didn't really know what that meant. And we prayed for these kids and God healed them. And they went on a healing journey. They sat in our church for four years they actually started to serve. They, got, they, they made friends. They just didn't know what this was. It took four years to get to a point where they could act. They had it all together. They had successful business. They had money. They had great education. They're smart people. Looked like they had it all together in their heart. They knew they needed something more. And after four years, they put their faith in Jesus. I got to, to baptize them. And I just had this little reminder. This is not just a lifestyle change. Their eternal destinies have just changed. And it wasn't just their household that got baptised. Now fast forward, you know, just a couple of years and Kate comes from a broken uh, family. Not everyone has two step mums, but she does. Both of her step mums have now come to face, sit in the second row with her on a Sunday. And just on Easter Sunday, her 91-year-old grandmother who turned her back on God, thought that he was mean and distant and nasty when she was 10 years old, 81 years later, discovers that she's got a loving father in heaven who sent his son to be her saviour. And she declares it in front of the whole church on Easter Sunday, 91 years old and getting baptised whole households generational change she's the first convert and there's plenty like that in our community today second convert in Philippi is a troubled young teenage girl she's uh, been possessed by a demon she's telling people's futures she's following Paul and his mates around and making fun of them saying at the top of her voice these men you know servants of the most high God telling you how, how to be saved in verse 18 I love verse 18 it says, Paul became so annoyed. 
You've got to remember, Paul, you know, the Apostle Paul, you know, the writer of the New Testament, Paul, is an ordinary person like me and you. He gets annoyed. People get up his nose. Put your hand up if some people have got up your nose. You know, put your hand up if you're sitting next to them. <laughs> don't, don't be silly. Put it right there. It gives me great hope. Great hope that God uses ordinary people to be part of his eternal purposes. If you don't believe that, go and read Paul's history and see the way that God used him. But, but all the mistakes that he made and the bad things that he did. Paul gets so annoyed, casts a demon out of her. She's the second convert in, in Philippi. And we've got a generation growing up that may not all be possessed by demons, but some are tormented by mental health issues. Some are tormented by confusion about sexuality and identity. Some, some are tormented by loneliness. We've got a generation desperately need Jesus. I've shared the story of my uh, third daughter, Bronte, here before, but let me, let me just give you a little update today. When she was 14, she got anorexia nervosa, darkest time of our lives. We had to wheel her in a wheelchair into the Logan Psychiatric uh, Ward because her heart was so weak she couldn't walk there. And uh, we could just see her at intermittent times. The worst day for me was the day I was trying to share with her in the meeting room uh, that, you know, God had hope for her. There was a way. She was so angry about the world and angry with God, she just started screaming at me. And the doctor came in and sent me out, said, you're doing more harm than good. That God put a prayer in Susan and I's heart that one day we'd stand in the baptistry with her as God had, she had a testimony of healing. And four years later, we got to do that. And then a couple of months later, she actually moved to Cambodia, worked there for a year, ministering to girls who desperately needed healing, and God continued to heal her heart. In the last couple of years, she's given me permission to share her story when I go to churches. And I've asked her if she'd want to come and join me one day and share uh, her, her story. And she always said, no, I'm not ready. But in May this year, she came home and she's laughing because she just got a new tattoo it said blessed and it was the same day that we started a new series at church on the Beatitudes called blessed and I, I said to Bront what are you going to do next month when the series is called the four horsemen of the apocalypse <laughs> I mean where are you going to tattoo that it's not every day you celebrate when your kids come home with a tattoo but I said to Bront what's it mean she said, Dad, I just never want to forget how blessed I am. I remember where I was. And I remember, you know, I, 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 I wanted to punch the guy when he said this. I don't normally punch people, but I wanted to punch this guy. When she was discharged from hospital, the nurse said to her, you'll be back. You always come back. And on Mother's Day this year, for the first time, nine years later, Bronte stood on a stage in front of thousands of people and said, I've never been back. And I'm so blessed, I never want to forget it, that God of heaven didn't take his eyes off me. He, I got no other explanation than God healed me and people kept praying for me and didn't give up and I've got it tattooed forever. I am blessed by the God of heaven. I'm here to tell someone today, don't give up praying for your kids. However dark it gets, however far they push God, however far they seem from God, don't give up praying for your kids. On Mother's Day, sitting in the front row was a couple that had stood in our lounge room with us for nine years, praying for each other's kids. It was a youth leader who had walked alongside Bronte, gone into that hospital when she didn't want her there. Nine years, still mentoring her today. It takes a whole community, it takes a whole church to see the power of Jesus break through and to see lives restored and it's going to take a whole community to see it happen for this next generation but he's still doing it he's still doing it third third convert in uh in philippi was an old crusty philippian jailer he'd uh, probably been uh, a roman officer probably bowed down to all sorts of roman gods but when god sends an earthquake into that prison and busts the doors open and uh, Paul and Silas and his companions were able to escape. The jailer comes in and like many men in our nation, was hopeless. He was going to kill himself. And Paul calls out, says, don't do it. 
And he shares the good news of Jesus with him. And it says in uh, verse, I can't read 30 something. It says, at that hour, the, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, everyone say immediately, he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before him. The whole family got baptised. Can I encourage you? Don't, don't give up. There are men in our community, there are men in your workplace just like this Roman jailer. And they might have hard hearts. I was preaching this passage earlier in the year and that word immediately just jumped out at me. And I said to our church, I said, someone here needs to get baptised immediately. You've put your faith in Jesus in the last few days and you haven't come prepared to get baptised but I've got a whole bunch of clothes and towels backstage and you're going to get baptised immediately. And there's a man named Mark in the back row, 84 years old, been resistant to the gospel his whole life. He's the first one, stepped out of his row, walked all the way to the front and stood in the baptistry with his son, declared his faith in Jesus Christ at 84 years old. I went to Steve, his son, I said, how long have you been praying for your dad? 35 years. Steve became a Christian when he was 15, prayed for his dad for 35 years. Did Alpha at the end of last year, started coming to church for the first time. God's broken in. Two weeks ago, he joined our welcome team. He just wants to welcome more people into the community. First time serving in church at 84 years old. Don't give up praying. There are people out there desperately needing Jesus and there might be some hard hearts and some hard ground, but prayer is breaking up that hard ground and there'll be a day when the power of heaven gets tipped out over those people that you've been praying for and breakthrough will come and generational blessings will flow. Unexpected people, unexpected places plant unprecedented churches. The bit that is, you don't see immediately in this passage This is the church in Philippi and these are the first three converts. Paul leaves them in Lydia's house. People from different socioeconomic backgrounds didn't normally come together until the church came to this region. People looked in, saw this church in unity together. People who loved one another who didn't normally love one another. But what we don't see, this is the first ever church in Europe. First ever. And these are the three that God picks. Macedonia's modern day Greece. The the, the gospel hadn't got to Europe to this point. Churches hadn't been planted in Europe. But the gospel continued to spread throughout Europe and it made its way eventually to Australia so that churches got planted here and we are part of something that God has been doing. The Spirit has burst at Pentecost and He's been moving for the last 2,000 years. And I believe we're in an exciting season right now that we as a church, if we are unified on mission in this nation, we can see the blessing of God poured out like we've never seen before. Listen to what Paul writes to this church in Philippi about 10 years uh, later in Philippians 1. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I'll know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. I believe it's a word for our Queensland Baptist family in this season. Stand firm in one spirit. Strive together as one for the gospel and we will see the gospel spread throughout this nation like we've never seen it before. It's why I believe God's led us to all do Alpha together, Term 3, 2023. And you're going to see fruit here, I know. And you've seen much fruit here over the years. I'm praying for a multiplication like Pastor Nathan prayed for before. But what I'd love you to do, what you you probably don't see and understand is there's churches in our movement that haven't baptised anyone for five or ten years. And they're just hanging on. Would you pray with me in term three that there'd be churches in our movement who would baptise their first person in a decade as they do Alpha? Would you pray with me? God's gone beyond us more than what I, I dreamed, asked or imagined. We've got aged care centres that are part of our Baptist family that are leading Alpha this term. All of our prison chaplains in all the prisons in uh, Queensland. Schools, 
people here reaching out into their workplaces, into their, into their uh, lounge rooms, lead an alpha. I'm believing God's going to do something like we've never seen before. It's just ordinary people. Listen to the unction of the Spirit. Filled with the power of the Spirit, with an urgency just to take the gospel to people around us. We're going to see unexpected people in unexpected places plant unprecedented churches. Would you pray with me right across this state that we would see a mighty harvest of souls for the kingdom as we reach out to our community with the good news of Jesus? I pray God's been speaking to you this morning. I'd love to pray for a bunch of people. If, if you just feel and this is what God's saying to you, as I say it, would you just stand? If you're here today and you say, I want to be obedient to the unction of the Holy Spirit this week and just go wherever he tells me to go and say whatever he tells me to say. If your prayer is give me ears to hear and courage to obey, can I just get you to stand this morning? Just stand where you are. There's others of you here this morning and you know there's something you need to let go of. Might be disappointment, disillusionment, might be busyness or control. And you know today the challenge is let go. Say, God, come and fill me. Fill me afresh with your spirit. God, come and fill me with power. If that's your prayer today, come on, just stand where you are. Fill me with power. Fill me with an urgency to share the gospel. I just believe there's others of you here today and, and God's just putting faith in your heart for generational change. Maybe you've been praying for decades and it's just been a prompt for you. Do not give up praying. You're praying for generational blessings to flow and it feels like there's an obstacle or a roadblock right now and you're praying that that, that obstacle would be removed and generational blessings would continue to flow because prodigals would come home. And there's others of you, you're first generation Christians and you are praying, you are praying for generational curses to be broken off and that the, that the blessing would flow. There'd be an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance that would flow down through the generations. If that's you today, just give me a little wave and say, that's what God's putting faith in my heart for, generational change. Let me pray. Just put your arms out, ready to receive. Father, thank you. <laughs> thank you that you, you love people so much. You love us so much that you would give your one and only son if we put our faith in you, if we believe in you, you'll forgive us of our sin. God, you'll set us free from our past. and you'll Give us a new life, a resurrected life, a life of freedom with you. Thank you that you're so good. Thank you that you see every heart today. God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, just come and minister to every heart. Every, everyone with open arms today, God, just come by your Spirit. God, fill them with faith. God, would you give us ears to hear the unction of your spirit? Because it's just a simple prompt that we trust it and you give us courage to obey. And you lead us to people who desperately need Jesus. And God, I pray for those who need to let go of something. I particularly pray for someone that needs to let go of disappointment today. God, would you help them to do it right now? Just surrender it to you. Let it go. God, come and fill them. Fill them. Fill us, God, with the power of Your Holy Spirit, an urgency that we would be compelled to reach out, not through guilt, not, not through someone just motivating us or, or, or trying to you know, pump us up, but God, Your Spirit will be at work. We just can't help it. We just can't help but open our mouths and tell people about how good You are. Fill us with power today. God, just come on, just give us a wave. You want generational blessing flowing down through your family. God, today, God, I ask in the Name of Jesus for generational blessing would flow. God, where, where there's obstacles, where there's prodigals that have wandered from You, would You change hearts, transform hearts. God, fill us with faith. God, a persevering faith that we would pray and not give up until we see it happen, God. That we would see whole families redeemed, households baptised. God, that we would see generation after generation living in Your goodness and grace. That we, our testimony would be, surely Your love and goodness will follow me and my family. 
all the days of my life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Fill us with faith today, God. I pray in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. Hey, who here? Who, who here just believing for revival in our nation? Who believe in those churches across our nation gather together and pray and just take the good news out into the community? We can see God do something we've never seen before. Church on fire, churches full like this right across our state, right across our nation. Who's believing? Revival in our nation, in our generation. Awesome. Let's, uh, let's declare it together, church.